Hello, my name is Daniela Fernandez. I'm the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and I have dedicated my life to solving for Global Goal 14, life underwater, conserving the world's ocean, seas, and marine resources. I am so honored to announce that the 2021 Flourish Prize for Goal 14 is awarded to ORA Estuaries in New Orleans, Louisiana, USA. This organization uses 3D printing technology to build concrete structures along the coast that help facilitate and empower coastal communities to rebuild historic oyster reefs that provide storm resilience, food security, and economic opportunity. Well done, ORA Estuaries. You should be very, very proud. Hi, I'm Megan Buchter. I'm the director of the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit at Case Western Reserve University. At the Fowler Center, we run a program called Aim to Flourish that strives to teach students around the world about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and businesses' role in helping to achieve them. As part of this program, students seek out business leaders and social entrepreneurs and conduct interviews with them about their amazing business innovations that are making the world a better place. Another part of this program is our annual Flourish Prizes. Every year, we award 17 Flourish Prizes, one for each of the UN Sustainable Development Goals to stories written and published on Aim to Flourish in the previous calendar year. Today, I have the great honor of being here with our Flourish Prize honoree team for global goal number 14, Life Underwater. I'm here with our professor, Chris Castile from Nichols State University, one of his student authors, Otto, and business leader, Tyler Ortego from Aura Estuaries. Thank you so much to everybody for being here with me today. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to speak with you. Chris, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I remember talking to you the very first time that we talked, you said about five years ago, um, before you introduced Aim to Flourish in your class and look how far we've come. Um, how, have you, how have you been using Aim to Flourish in your class and what are some of the results that you've seen? Thank you for asking, Megan. Um, so I use Aim to Flourish in my course on um, human relations and interpersonal skills. In that class, students are learning how to work in teams, learning how to manage themselves, learning very social skills like managing conflict, uh, communicating supportively. And in this class, I, um, I run various team projects through it. And the one that I've been the most satisfied with because of the positive approach it brings into the classroom and it encourages appreciative inquiry, which translates into so many different kinds of interventions that students can take with them in their lives. Um, I love the project. I'm excited to bring it into my classes and um, students get a whole lot out of it. They're looking around at businesses in the surrounding area, in the Bayou region of deep South Louisiana to try and find businesses that are doing something beyond profitable. Um, and something that's having a broader social impact, something that's aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and students enjoy the project. Uh, they um, learn how to work in a team that's been tasked with um, doing something I think is truly special, but also for them, I tell them like, you may have come into this class thinking that, yeah, you're gonna learn how to manage yourself more effectively, um, but if you listen to what we are asking you to, to, to go out and find, you're going to leave as a published author. And for them that, you know, that, uh, they're curious, uh, they perk up a bit for that. Um, and I've just seen a lot, they get a lot out of it. And uh, I uh, tend on continue using the project moving forward in my classes. That's great. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. You have um, a very different class structure, I think, than, than a lot of our classes. I mean, we we really, we tell all of our, our professors, our interested professors that Aim to Flourish could fit into pretty much anything. Um, but it is really interesting to hear that your class is more focused on those interpersonal skills, less so focused on, let's say, sustainability or, or ethics or one of the other topics that many of our classes are focused on. Right. And I think there's still such a strong tie there because I think 
I think deep down, I'm an, I'm a psychologist, an industrial organizational psychologist by training. I think, I think people generally want to do something meaningful for society. And I think when you can see that you can do something meaningful in a team setting, that's really powerful. And you can identify innovations that need to be celebrated. I think all of that is powerful. So I, even though it is a bit out of left field, there are so many beautiful ties into the content that we're covering. Um, so maybe a bit unexpected, but it's certainly an addition to the class. That's great. I mean, we are, we're happy to be included. Uh, can you tell just tell us just a little bit about how you use Aim to Flourish in the course? How many is it introduced at the beginning, due at the end of the semester, short-term project? How have you incorporated it? Sure. So it's a semester-long project. I introduce it uh, right after forming the teams. Um, and it's the first thing that they get to see before we even talk about um, how does a team develop and grow over time. So it's a project I introduce and we touch various parts of the project over the course of the entire semester. Um, but what I do is I use it primarily as a vehicle, a stimulus, if you will, for them to learn about how to work together in a team setting, um, how to manage conflict, how to, uh, how to contract with your teammates, build expectations, build consensus, um, how to move a project forward. Um, so it's primarily used in, uh, from that perspective. Uh, that being said, by the end of the course, when everything starts to get turned in, um, uh, students are starting to make the stronger connections to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. By the end of the class, what happens at the uh, on the last day of class, all students are presenting their paper in a poster form like you would at an academic conference. Um, so everyone gets a poster printed courtesy of the library. They do it for free for us, thankfully. Um, we put them all up in the, in the classroom. And students get to go around and see the see the innovations that were identified uh, in the various team projects. Ask questions of one another. Uh, it's a pretty exciting day where everyone gets to just celebrate um, being done with the project and also, you know, having identified something that, in their view, is is very meaningful. Um, you can see business doing something for a broader impact on stakeholders beyond just what's financial. So. Well, that's really great. And I would love to see some of these posters because um, that sounds that sounds really wonderful. Happy to um, share. Great. Thank you. Uh, Otto, I would love to hear from you about going through the Aim to Flourish assignment, being a part of that team. I know that your teammates weren't able to make it here with us today and, and that's OK. Um, but I'd love to hear about your experience doing the Aim to Flourish assignment. Yeah, you know, it, it was uh it was very exciting to go through that process, you know, because as Dr. Castillo mentioned, you know, they told us at the beginning of the project, you know, you have the, the possibility to be a published author at the end of this and, you know, really study something that's going to be impactful and something that could possibly be, you know, changing our world for the better. And, you know, that was something that, you know, piqued my interest and, you know, I was very excited to, to learn more about, and, you know, get and dive deep into this project. And, you know, Dr. Castile has, was mentioning how, you know, through his class, he tries to help us with, you know, learning how to work within a team setting. And, you know, that was the first semester, I think, that we had gotten into COVID and, you know, learning how to do everything virtually. And, you know, with the, the lessons that, you know, he kind of put in, in through the teachings and through the class and then also working through this project has really helped me. Uh, in my professional growth now with where I am, because everything is really done virtually now. You know, I'm working for a company that just opened up uh, headquarters in Providence, Rhode Island, and I'm located in New Orleans, Louisiana. So a lot of the lessons that he's taught us, you know, through the class and working in a team setting has, you know, really translated into what I'm doing today. That's really great to hear. You, you didn't even know you were going to get all of that experience in one class. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Very lucky. Um, so how did you find Aura Estuaries and Tyler? So it was kind of just a process of just doing some digging into sustainable companies that, you know, we're looking into various innovations that could benefit the coastal zones of Louisiana because coastal erosion is, is something that we are very aware of here in, in, Thibodeau, Louisiana, and the coastal regions, and something that's, you know, kind of close to home, and, you know, I was very interested in, you know, once getting a better understanding of what the UN Global Goals were, uh, you know, understanding 
what his innovation was and then just being able to reach out to him. You know, Tyler was very receptive throughout the whole process and, you know, very welcoming to, to me and the rest of my teammates and, you know, really helping us out and understand what his technology was, you know, where he likes to implement it and what, it, what it's doing to, to really help our, our communities in South Louisiana and, and the Gulf Coast region. So were, were you just, your group was specifically interested in kind of coastal erosion and companies that were inter, that were, you know, making that a better situation or that was specifically part of the project? Uh, that was, you know, uh, Dr. Castile kind of left it open to, it kind of had left it open to us to, to really be able to, you know, do our own research and, and figure out what companies we could uh, find that were within the scope that could meet one of the, the UN global goals. And, you know, we, we kind of identified uh, a few of the global goals and you know, global goal number 14, life below water, uh, was something that we had uh, had a little bit of a peaked interest in. And, you know, and then that led us to do some research into companies that might be doing innovations in the region uh, that are, you know, going towards that global goal. And that's how we came across uh, Aura Estuaries and, and Tyler's uh, company. And it was, uh, you know, like I said, he, he was very receptive and very helpful and really enjoyed getting to speak with him. I actually still have the, uh, the recording of our conversation that we had a couple of years back. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a lot of great stuff that he's doing down there. And you know, I really enjoyed learning about it and, you know, really learning more about the UN Global Goals in this process that you know, we're, we're in with the, the Aim to Flourish uh, prize that we've been awarded. And Megan, just to give you some context, it's a particularly salient issue for uh, South Louisiana. Um, uh, long story short, by the way, that the Mississippi has basically been uh, kept together. And I, we had these levees built to stop it from like peppering the, the coastline with sediment. Essentially, the coastline is being washed away, football field today. Um, it's, uh, it's a trillion dollar problem to fix. Um, so it's a big salient problem that everyone in this area is um, uh, well acquainted with. So it's definitely like, I mean, I get my students carte blanche to, to look for, for um, businesses that are doing something uh, beyond profitable. Like it's probably no surprise that this is something that, that came about. Um, and still, it's it's incredibly important that we celebrate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Otto, I love hearing that part of your story because I love that you kind of focused in on a global goal that you were interested in and then found a company that was in that space so that you had the opportunity, you and your team had the opportunity to learn more about a, a space, about an industry that you were really interested in. So I'm always curious how students pick and choose and find the organizations that they get a chance to interview. So that's a really, um, that's a really cool story. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to share it. We're, we're super happy to hear it. Very happy that you're here with us. Well, Tyler, I'm super excited that you're here with us today because I would love to hear more directly from you about Aura Estuaries and about what your company does. Uh, hi, my name is Tyler Ortigo. I'm one of the uh, founder of Aura Estuaries. Uh, I've been working on growing living oyster reefs in the coastal protection infrastructure um, pretty much my whole adult life since I was a, a senior at LSU back in the day. Um, what happened, I was an engineering student trying to figure out what the heck to do with my life. And uh, a friend of mine who didn't end up becoming one of my business partners said, you should look into coastal engineering. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a thing. I can go work on the coast. Uh, you know, I had grown up uh, fishing and throwing cast nets my whole life. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a revelation, right? And, uh, so he was working on his master's thesis, which was growing oyster reefs uh, into engineered structures. And so I, I was a student worker and I sort of followed on after him. And, you know, uh, you start getting after, after midnight and you get you kind know, of making big plans, right? Uh, we ended up with patents, and we, uh, we formed a company. We've got miles of this stuff out in the water. Uh, you know, it's been a long journey, so it's uh, we're, we're evolving, and hopefully, hopefully, getting better at it. Uh, probably one of the you know things we're most proud of is that pretty much every one of our installations survived the record 2020 hurricane season uh, intact. So we haven't uh, been able to get out in the sets too much uh, since Hurricane Ida, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to find everything still in place. That's great. 
That's great. So can you tell us a little bit about how you build, how you build these? The, uh, so the, the way we, we make our oyster reefs is by making a, a concrete friendly skeleton in the shape of, uh, of an engineered structure or an oyster friendly skeleton. Uh, we use concrete because the oysters like it. Uh, it's got a good, that's a good material for attachment. It's solid. It's heavy enough not to get thrown around in the, in the waves uh, before the oysters grow there. Uh, the, the goal is uh, how, how much oyster can we get and how little concrete. Uh, so the, the first generation, we used precast concrete. Uh, sizes range, we made them from 70 pounds to uh, the, the most common one was uh, over a ton. Um, so they're, you know, they're heavy, but they actually cover a lot of ground. So they're, they're very efficient space-wise. Uh, compared to a, a rock protective structure, we're using, you know, it could be a quarter, it could be as little as a tenth of the material to get the same result. Um, and then the oysters take it over. And so at the uh, lightest end of the scale, we've actually made what I call oyster stakes, which are just concrete cylinders on a on a stake. And we go out in really, really um, low energy, uh, you know, protected environments where we're focusing on the oyster growth more than the protection and when we get them out there. Um, one of uh, one of the, the fruits of our of our labors over the years is uh, as a new form of 3D printing for concrete. Uh, so we've since spun that out uh, to a company called Matrix, which is where a lot of the, the action is happening right now. That's really interesting. And so, tell us a little bit about just how this helps keep the coastline intact. In Louisiana, we have this uh, situation where the the belt is kind of starved of sediments. And so as it as it naturally sinks, it's not getting built back up. So we're, we're losing wetlands, um, and as uh, these little ponds get bigger, the waves increase. There's more more distance for the wind to blow over. The bigger waves hit the bank, and they erode it more, and so it's kind of a, a you know a vicious circle. Uh, by putting a physical structure against that bank line, you could somewhat mitigate the effects of those waves. Um, naturally, the way that occurs is uh, oyster reefs would grow right up into uh, that interface with the plants. In fact, you'll often see them sort of mingle together or you'll see oysters growing on the plant roots. And so we're uh, just trying to replicate that natural process as much as possible. It's really interesting. Um, and are you, do you do this just in Louisiana or in other places as well? Uh, the, the bulk of my work has been in Louisiana. Uh, Natrix is located in North Carolina and they're, they're really taking a pretty, a much broader emphasis. Okay, great. Great. And so now I'm just curious, um, you know, Otto or one of his teammates reached out to you and said, I'm doing this assignment. Will you interview with us? Um, and you said, yes. So, you know, a lot of students send out emails and they never hear anything back. So what about, um, you know, what about Otto and his team's email really like got you to, to do the interview with this, this, this student group? Yeah. So, uh, I got, I got Otto's email, uh, you know, out of out of the blue, not it, not expecting it. Uh, you know, one of one of the parks, uh, you know, aspects of my mission is is to be a part of the community and contribute. And so, the opportunity to work with with students who are coming up um, and you know, possibly going to be be leaders, you know, in the, in the near future, would seem like a seem like a no brainer. Well, we are incredibly happy that you said yes. I'm sure Otto and his team are as well. Um, because we're very, very thrilled that we get to share this Aim to Flourish story and share this video and share you as our Flourish Prize honoree for Global Goal 14 Life Underwater. Um, I usually like at the end to just give anybody else an opportunity if there's anything else that they want to add to the story, if they want to say, um, you know, about the about the assignment or about the experience. Um, just give anybody else a, a minute if they want to add anything else. I'll add something. Um, it was so pleasant at the beginning hearing the uh, the connection Otto and Tyler uh, have indirectly. It seems we were chatting a little bit off uh, uh, outside of the, the, the talk here, and it's it's so nice to see uh, those things as a professor. I I'm grateful Tyler for you um, for uh, interviewing uh, with um, Otto and his team. Thank you very much for that time, um, Otto. Great work, uh, and good to see that you're doing so well. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it definitely definitely wasn't just me. You know, the rest of my team, you know, we were all worked very hard on this. And 
So Dr. Castillo, you, you did a lot to, to help us throughout the process and you know, really just opening our eyes to, to this project and, and getting this assignment completed and done and really giving us the tools to, to broaden our horizons and, and look out there. And yeah, Tyler, you know, uh, really, really appreciate you, you taking the time to speak with us a couple years back and, and do this. It was you know, very interesting to, to learn about your company. And, you know, like Chris had mentioned, uh, you know, it kind of spurred me into looking more into, uh, you know, coastal preservation and, and renewable energy and just all these UN global goals, uh, you know, because currently now I'm working for a company called Crowley Maritime uh, in their new energy division, focusing on offshore wind and just looking to bring solutions uh, of renewable energy to the Gulf of Mexico region. All right. You know, from uh, from my perspective, I just sat in on one phone call and answered some questions, and and then all of a sudden, here we are. <laughs> well, look at the so impact some, that you've had. Did some good work. Yes. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and I would say uh, Otto. So it sounds like you would be a good person for a student team to call and interview, then, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we're we're definitely we're definitely looking into quite a few things. Uh, you know, we're trying to be on the forefront of renewable energy and, you know, the renewable uh, sector itself. So you know, I'd be more than happy to, to be a service and help any any other people at Nichols in your class looking to, to, you know, look into the global goals in the UN 30 by 30. Oh, cool. Thank you. You might be hearing from me. <laughs> Life comes full circle. I love it. That it does. It's wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much to all of you for being here with me today and getting taking the time out of your day to have this conversation to learn about how the assignments has been how the aim to flourish assignment has been used at Nichols State University and Otto, you're in your team's experience and hear more about aura estuaries from Tyler. Um, I really appreciate it. Our global goal 14 life underwater flourish prize honoree team for 2021. Um, thank you so much. And we really look forward to continuing the celebration with you um, into the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.